Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. It's Wednesday, so you know what that means. It's time for another midweek mini mail call. And on today's video, we're actually gonna be taking a look at what's underneath the 70s towel here, because yes, I'm recording the intro after I've already done the unboxing and done the video. So <laughs> it's this. So if you have any guesses to what you think this might be, put a comment in the comment section below. Otherwise, watch the rest of the video and I will be unboxing it and taking a look at this thing. Before we get started, I wanna mention that I have a second channel now. I've mentioned it a few times, but just in case anyone's curious and hasn't looked at it, there'll be a link in the description below. Check that out. It will have sort of more unscripted, well, none of my vid videos are scripted. It'll have less edited, more quick takey, random stuff on there, including candy reviews. And of course, the reason for this second channel is Sometimes I'm just working on stuff that I'm not making a video of and I find something I think is kind of cool and I'll just want to shoot a quick video about it and I'll upload it to the second channel. It's not really enough for me to make a full video to go on this channel, which is the reason for that second channel. So yeah, check that out and get subscribed. Uh, the, the subscriptions on that channel actually really help me out because that channel is just starting out. In addition, of course, I also want to mention that I do have a Patreon now. So if anyone wants to support the channel, you can do so. There'll be a link in the description below. Okay, that's enough intro. So without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, well, I have a package here that's really big. It's stacked up next to the bench here. You just see the top of it. it. Comes from Jonathan in Centerville, Virginia. It's so big, I think I need to reposition the camera so we can take a look at what this stuff is as I open it, so we can all see it together. All right, we have two boxes here. So I'm gonna open up the first box. He wrote box one of two on here. This is gonna be interesting to open because the flaps are so big here. Let's cut this away. Let's lift the flap here. This will have been a very difficult thing to pack and ship. You can see the top of a monitor here. So let's hope that it all survived okay. It so far looks okay. The box is intact. This here will be a keyboard wrapped in there. Oh. All right, I think I am ready to lift this out. Wow, this is heavy. Oh boy. We're getting a glimpse of what this thing is. So it's an AT&T workstation, PC7300. I'm not sure if that's the actual model number of it, but that's written on the bottom of the monitor there. And it's rather big and heavy. And what's awesome is it has survived shipping without an issue. The monitor does not come off. It's all integrated in. So it's pretty unwieldy to ship, but that worked, Jonathan, that worked. Here in this little bag is the original AT&T mouse for this thing, which is a three button affair, has a ball and a very proprietary connector that goes in somewhere onto the side of this machine. So I'll put that right there. And in this bubble wrap cocoon here is the original keyboard Look at that, survived, totally intact. Ooh, that feels nice to type on too. The keyboard is in fantastic shape and I think it's quite possible that it somehow connects up here into there like that. And then it actually clips on there, which is weird because it obscures the disk drive. But I guess that's just the way this thing can possibly work. Oh, that feels really cool. And then you can slide that off, but this can go on like that. That is just so funny. There's actually a connector on the keyboard, which is probably where the mouse plugs in like that. And then the mouse routes through this cable guide so that when you put the keyboard back on there, mouse comes out the side there. That is just so cool. I know so little about this machine. It runs some version of AT&T Unix though, and it's from sometime in the eighties. So this is way before Linux was a thing, for instance. New camera angle because I've gone and had dinner and came back downstairs. So we have one more box for the AT&T PC7300 
Let's open this up. Right off the bat, we have a letter. We'll put that with the other letter. And in this box, we have manuals and things. So we have AT&T Unix PC development tools, AT&T Unix PC service manual, very handy if this thing is not working properly. AT&T Unix PC getting started. And the AT&T Unix PC Model 7300 LPI COBOL Programmer's Guide. But wait, there's more. The AT&T Unix PC 7300 Owner's Manual. And another one. AT&T Unix PC 7300 Unix Utilities. This looks like a bunch of floppy disks in here. And there's another one. AT&T Unix PC System Software. There's a bunch of disks in there. And the AT&T Unix PC Communication Management. And I think that's it for the box. Well, all I can say is this is simply incredible. Jonathan packed this up really nicely. And this machine is gonna be a fascinating computer to explore. You might be able to tell from my clothes, but a little bit of time has passed since I actually unboxed this computer from Jonathan. So let's take a look at the letters he sent and see what he said. Adrian, I've included one AT&T Unix PC 7300 model 3B1. The machine was given to me by a friend. The MFM hard drive won't format and I don't know if it is repairable. I've seen MFM hard drive emulators that would work as a replacement, but I wasn't ready to spend the money and time getting one working. And indeed, just like the SCSI to SD, there are MFM hard drive emulators, but they cost quite a lot of money, and I'm not sure about their compatibility either. Luckily, I have more MFM hard drives that do work, so I can put one of them in this computer to see about getting it booted up. He goes on to say that he replaced the soldered CMOS battery with a holder, so replacing the battery now is more convenient. I had a lot of fun opening the computer up and playing with it, Four screws, which are shown in the service manual, have to be removed to pop the top off. And yeah, as you saw while I was unboxing it, the service manual is in here and I have taken a look at it. And it has very detailed instructions on servicing this machine, which is excellent. There is a diagnostic disc included with one of the manuals and it lets you test various components and format the hard drive. Also included in the manuals is the system software needed to install the OS when you get a functioning hard drive. There are three slots on the back for expansion cards. One is empty, one has a memory expansion, and one has a standalone DOS system. That's right. In here is actually a DOS emulation card that allows you to run DOS or PC software in a window. This machine has a graphical user interface from my understanding, and I think this entire thing is based on a Motorola 68000, maybe it's a 6810 processor with a GUI, and with that DOS card, it brings PC compatibility to this thing. I think AT&T realized that when this, this was released, DOS compatibility was actually a big deal at that point, that people would wanna run software. So that was an optional card you could buy and install on this, and this machine has that card. Jonathan says, I hope you enjoy working on this computer. It is built like a tank and weighs a ton. Well, I certainly figured that out moving it out of the box. At the time of shipping, everything was working except the hard drive. If the monitor looks dim, there are brightness controls on the left side to adjust it. In total, there are two boxes. Hope everything arrives safely. And yep, I'd say that everything is absolutely perfect. I see no physical damage whatsoever on this from its shipping, which Jonathan, I have to commend you because this thing is so unwieldy. I just, it's amazing that it came through shipping so well. There's a second letter from Jonathan here. He just sort of talks about the packing of the manuals and stuff. So nothing particularly interesting there. Let's take a look at the service manual. I think there are specs for this machine in here. Now there's a little bit of mildew, I suppose, on the bottom of this manual. Some of them have that, but the computer itself has no evidence of ever having been exposed to water or moisture. Although I won't know for sure until I open it up and look inside. So AT&T Unix PC service manual. Let's see what this talks about. 1985 is the date here. So it gives us an idea of the time period for this machine. So 
So, the Unix PC is an intelligent desktop workstation that provides users with personal computer and enhanced voice and data communication services. Provides a Unix System 5 virtual memory operating system. The Unix PC can connect to a telephone system to allow communication with other telephones, workstations, and computers. Direct connection or connections through a local area network to other terminals, workstations, or computers is also provided. The Unix PC can be upgraded to a multi-user system. So I don't know if that means multiple graphical user interfaces or just terminal interfaces on those additional ports with the main GUI being on the main unit. There's a breakdown of the machine as we've already seen. Keyboard can slot on top here, or of course you can pull it down to use it away from the machine. And here we are, here are the specs. Motorola 6810 central processing unit with 10 megahertz clock speed, virtual memory up to four megabytes, one meg of standard RAM, two megabytes is an option, 720 by 348 bitmap graphics monitor, RS-232 serial port, Centronics parallel port, keyboard interface, telephone interface, which let's see here, seems to be 300, 1200 baud modem, AT&T module models 103 and 212. Those were the standards of, I think, 300 baud and 1200 baud. Hard drive interface, floppy drive interface, Expansion bus interface, which has 21 address lines, 16 data lines, bus mastering by expansion hardware, and a real-time clock. I'm not aware of any personal computers that use the 6810 for Motorola. If anyone's aware, uh, please put a comment in the comment section below. It's really not that different than the 68000. I think it's just slightly faster and maybe has a couple extra instructions. I actually have a 6810 chip that is the same package as the regular 68000 and you can stick it into like an Amiga and it does speed the machine up just a little bit, but I think it adds some slight incompatibility as well. The monitor is a green phosphor 12 inch CRT. The mouse connects to the keyboard unit as I figured out when I unboxed it. The audio monitor is an audible indicator consisting of a small speaker provide, provided for monitoring telephone calls when you're using the telephone manager. What? A user accessible volume control is illustrated uh, on the next picture, I guess, or maybe that was on figure 1.1. So it, it kind of goes without saying that since AT&T was all about telephones at this time, they were the US's phone company, I guess uh, it makes sense that this machine has extra telephony stuff built in over and above regular machines. Data storage is either 10 megs or 20 meg half height or 40 megs or 67 megs full height hard drive Winchesters for mass storage. And it uses a double-sided 0.5 megabytes, three and a quarter inch floppy drive, 48 TPI. All right, so that means that this type of disc can be read and read in a normal PC. At least a PC's standard double density disc drive is 48 track per inch. And it says it's 320K formatted capacity. So that's close enough to the 360K that a PC uses. And that's good because I was intending to image all the disks before I really use them in case they get destroyed when I use them. And I should be able to use uh, IMD. That's a DOS program that I use all the time on my one of my PCs here. And as long as the disk is FM or MFM encoded, and of course the physical format is the same, so 48 track sprints, double-sided means it is, means that I should be able to use IMD to archive those disks. Has the pinout for the RS-232 port, nothing particularly interesting there. There is a diagnostic loopback plug. Well, there it is. Not sure, oh, is that for the Centronics port? Yeah, I guess that's for the printer port, serial port, the full pinout of the parallel port. And here is the logic board. So internal keyboard connector, phone line, hard drive connectors, floppy drive connector, video connector, battery, which is what Jonathan said he replaced that with uh, like a CR2032 holder or something like that. 6810 uses a standard dip package, which is nice. Those are still easily obtainable. Some custom ICs, things like that. All right. And we have a bus block diagram. I mean, there's nothing particularly revolutionary here. Address bus, data bus. CPU, ROM, RAM, DMA controller. So yeah, the 68000 allows bus mastering. So for DMA means really that something like a disk controller card, looks like there's a DMA controller that connects to the hard drive and the floppy drive. It can talk to RAM directly without CPU intervention, things like that. It's one of the nice things that the 68000 has right off the bat. 
the manual is talking about interrupts. It's talking about the bus arbitration. So like what takes precedence over what memory management. This manual's so far relatively thorough. And then here's all the diagnostic routines that it has, probably with that disc that Jonathan talked about. Looks like you boot the diagnostic floppy and that's where you can format the hard drive. Yeah, full system test, initialize hard disk, bad blocks, park the heads, remote diagnostics, reboot system. Very cool. Oh, and look at this, all the hard drives it supports. So we got mini scribe 10 meg, uh, a Tassi 3046, whatever that is, 40 megs, a Maxter Seagate Miniscribe, Rodime, Atassi, Hitachi, and others. I wonder if others allows you just to type in the heads and cylinders. Hopefully that's the case. But 10 meg Seagate. Do I have a 10 meg Seagate? Not sure I do. I have like a 251. That's what I was intending to put in here. But Miniscribe, maybe that's the same heads and cylinders. There's a nice troubleshooting section in the manual here. Talking about troubleshooting, logic board, stuff like that. That's handy. And here's a whole section on removing assemblies. Here's a section on disassembling the machine. It's how to get the top cover off. Look at that. So you take the top covers off in the connection, you tilt it onto its back there so you can keep the monitor connected while you troubleshoot this. <laughs> Looks quite serviceable too. Look at this, the entire I guess logic board flips up. I guess uh, is a hard drive, is that attached to the top? Maybe that's not the logic board, that is, oh yeah, the logic board's underneath. I think that's a carrier for the hard drive and the disk drive. Those would be the cables for it there. And it does look like it supports full height, five and a quarter inch hard drives, interesting. I have to wonder, are there schematics in here? That's what I'm curious about, because that would certainly be the most useful if really trying to troubleshoot this thing. Uh, no. Uh, unfortunately, it does not appear that there are schematics in here. Tape backup subassembly. I suppose if you needed board level repair, you would call AT&T and they would send someone out, a service technician, and that person would have schematics. I don't think necessarily that I'm gonna need schematics. Oh, look at this the service manual for the DOS 73 coprocessor card. The DOS 73 system gives you the best of both computing world, Unix and DOS. DOS 73, you can run most programs on your AT&T Unix PC that you can run on an AT&T 6300 and other DOS compatible PCs. There are thousands of programs available in DOS format. These include spreadsheets, database management, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we know that. So, right, all right, within minutes, you can get up and running with DOS. DOS 73 software implements MS-DOS 3.1 as a task on the Unix PC using DOS 73 hardware to emulate an IBM PC with Hercules graphics. The DOS 73 session can run on the Unix workstation PC monitor and keyboard or run as a remote task with an auxiliary terminal. <laughs> so over the ser serial port, Yes, you can run DOS programs. With DOS 73, you can create up to 256 virtual disks. And the virtual disks are Unix files that are created with the DOS 73 volume management utility. 12 virtual disks can be assigned to DOS volumes C through, C colon through N colon. DOS volumes are logical disk drives. All right, and there it is. There is the card and it goes into that expansion slot on the back of the machine. And unfortunately, that is that. No schematics. So if anyone knows that uh, schematics are available, if they're available online anywhere for this machine, I'd love to hear about that in the comment section below. Not that I think I need to do any repairs on this thing because like Jonathan said, it is working. But for the future, it would be nice to have those just in case I ever need them. I'd like to make a new diagnostic disc and not use the one that came with this machine. So I went online and I found that someone had a set of system software for this and I have the disk one here, Diag, and it looks like it's diagnostic disk version 3.51. It was a set of 12 disks, which I did find, which are the original system disks. And I'm gonna make this, I'm using IMD here, and I'm gonna write this onto a known good three and a half, or five and a quarter inch disk rather, and let's hit enter. And let's see what this does. So there we go. Double-sided, single step, double density, 10 sectors of 512K. So good, that definitely means I can image all the original disks with this program. 
And here are the original discs, like the system software discs. I'm trying to see what version it is. Oh, the label <laughs> just fell right off. Uh, this is version 3.0. So older than the stuff I found online, which was version 3.5.1, as I said. And I think the other version that's available online is 3.5. So I suppose that's definitely important for me to archive all of these discs. Oh, look, the original shipping disc is there. Uh, uh, diagnostic disc upgrade. What's this? Let's see what version this is. AT&T system software diagnostic disc. Doesn't show the version number. Anyhow, uh, like I said, I'll use the one I just made so I don't use any of these originals. It finished writing successfully. Here's the disc I just made. I'll slide this in to the floppy drive. Put the keyboard back into position. I have power cord plugged in. I have not turned this computer on since I got it, since I unboxed it. So this is really the first time. And here we go, let's see what happens. I heard some clicking in there. Hard drive is spinning up. All right, it's doing something, it's a little dim. Let me turn up those monitor controls on the side. Left side, he said. There they are, they're under the monitor. Oh yeah, it's a very stiff control, there we go. Hopefully that is in focus. We have 512K of onboard memory and a two expansion megabytes. The font looks really nice, really clear. The monitor looks good as well. Any key to continue? There's a diagnostic menu. Let's try full system test. Okay, what? Well, that didn't do anything. Oh, there we go. Initialize the floppy disk. Uh, no, because that's the diagnostic disk. Non-destructive test. While the test runs, let's take a quick look at the computer. So under here it says 67 megabytes. So that's obviously whatever hard drive is installed in here. If I move the keyboard out of the way, you can see the floppy drive there is running. It's doing a disk test. Here's the keyboard up close. A different layout than we're used to, right? It's got eight F keys and exit up down and message up down and just some extra keys. And like I mentioned in the unboxing, the, the feel of the keyboard is really nice. It feels, feels very nice to type on. If you look at the underside, uh, AT&T made in the USA. So there's the keyboard cable and the mouse. It does plug in right there and then routes through this little channel here. So it kind of fell out a little bit. And then this whole thing just nicely slots right back into the computer there. On the back here, here's the monitor. Not much to see, right? It's just two screws to get the cover off. And then on the back of the actual main unit here, we have a fan, which is kind of noisy, but it's running, blowing a lot of air, power, input. And here we can get a look at the main ports plus the expansion slots. So this one over here is the DOS card. It has a loopback connector, which I think the manual said it would have connected to it. I think it's a serial port specifically for the PC side of things. We have a parallel port, we have a serial port there, some phone ports. I think this is the RAM expansion card or maybe this is the RAM expansion card that has this metal pull handle. So that's probably just a blank cover. And on this side of the machine, there's a sticker here. It says AT&T Asset. So was this workstation actually used and owned by AT&T themselves? Quite possibly. And right here, there appears to be something and it's a slider. So this obviously is for the speaker probably for the modem, I guess, or the whatever, the phone connector. So you can make phone calls through this thing. I don't know if it's a speakerphone, but maybe you could plug a telephone handset into it and you could hear through this. It mentioned that in the service manual. And it looks like, I guess the floppy test finished. Enter to continue. All right, yeah, random seek. All right, well, this is a little boring. It kind of made a weird noise there on the floppy drive. Uh, recall disk, hard drive restore failed. So I guess that's the hard drive not working. And I guess that's that. Interesting, doesn't run any further than that. Well, I guess I'll just power this thing off. I'll take this disk out of here. And I am just curious to see what happens when I power it on without any floppy in here at all.
just have a single box up here in the corner. The fan is a little noisy. The bearings need to be lubricated on it. It's a little rattly sounding. I guess that's that. It doesn't really do anything. The floppy LED is on, but there's no disc in the drive, so that's not going to do anything. All right, well, anyways, we know the hard drive is dead. Jonathan confirmed that, and of course, the diagnostic disc just confirmed that, and it is definitely not booting here. But luckily, I have MFM controller, so I'll take that drive out, put it in a PC, see if I can rejuvenate it there. So clearly, there's a lot of stuff to do on this machine, a lot to explore. I am super fascinated by it. So I can't wait to dig into it a little bit more. But for this mail call video, I think I've done as much as I'm gonna do today. And you'll have to wait for a future video when I get back to this thing. Unfortunately, there's a lot of things in the pipeline right now. So it's not gonna be for a little while. I'm gonna store this thing away with all the discs and stuff, but I'm gonna probably start little by little archiving all of those discs. So if you are familiar with this particular system, you have resources you can point me to and you know that these versions of the discs are probably something I should archive. And if the manuals need to be scanned as well, are those available online? Please definitely comment down below and let me know the current state of affair for the documentation and the software for this machine so I can take appropriate action. I'm not sure that a full set of manuals like this is particularly common for these machines. So it might be something special. So really a huge thank you to Jonathan for packing this thing up, this beast, and sending it to me all the way from the East Coast. I really appreciate it and look for a future video when this thing is up and running and showing its glorious GUI and DOS compatibility and all that fun stuff in a future video. And with that, that's gonna be the end of this mail call video. Don't forget to check out my second channel if you haven't already and subscribe if you don't mind. And of course, if you like this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. And if you didn't like it, you know, do all that YouTube stuff, subscribe, thumbs down, etc. Put your comments in the comment section below. You could support me on Patreon if you so desire. You'll be seeing all the list of patrons scrolling up the left side of the screen here. I want to thank all of them very much for becoming patrons. It means so much to me. And of course, thanks to all the viewers who sent in stuff for mail call. As I mentioned, I think every time I have a big stack of stuff I'll be getting to. Plus, there's some things from the last batch I haven't opened, including a few things from 2020. I do apologize to the folks who haven't seen their package on here yet. But don't worry, I'll be getting to it. All right, that's going to be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.